my computer. Hello, and welcome back to another show here with the Grapevine Gallery. Uh, we are really in a special place today to talk with someone who I refer to as the First Lady of Fine Art in the United States of America. <laughs> this is Rosalind Hurley, or AKA Ros Remke. She is a wonderful artist and author. And we're gonna have a little book discussion about the book she wrote about her husband, Wilson, and all of his fine accomplishments, as well as uh, we're gonna talk about her work too as well. So it's gonna be a very exciting show today. We have a lot to go over and we could not be more thrilled to have Rosalind, or as we call her lovingly, Roz, with us today. So Roz, welcome to the show. Hey, it's very nice to be with you. Well, thank you, thank you. It's always too long. and Every time we get to visit, it's just so much fun. Um, I just, I always love being in your home and, you know, not just the art that's in there, but the beautiful views and all the wonderful little touches here and there you and Wilson have done over the years. It's just always a treat to come to what I call the Hurley Museum. Well, we're very lucky to have found this beautiful spot. Well, and as most people may or may not know, I'm not a full-time New Mexican as you and Wilson uh, lived. Um, Julie and I are part-time New Mexicans, uh, but that's a whole different conversation. We'll get into that some other time, but um, let's just start off and get going. I know that we've chatted a little bit before the show, but um, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us uh, your inspiration, as we've discussed about uh, the book that you wrote with Wilson, uh, of the biography you wrote about Wilson, and uh, just I'll let you take it from here. Well, I, th I thought after Wilson died, I uh, was trying to cope with having lost him. And um, I thought one of the easy ways would be to try to remember a lot of the stories that he used to tell. And he had, a, he had many stories from his family, from his childhood and uh, on through um, his experiences at West Point and uh, finally his decision after law school and practicing law for 13 years, his decision to uh, paint full time. He had been a painter, um, uh, a Sunday painter, probably all his life, but uh, he decided uh, after uh, a, a lot of hesitation and a lot of uh, angst that he would uh, devote himself to painting full time. And I thought that it was an interesting story. And, um, and then we were married, uh, he was already a painter. And um, so I was the record keeper. So I had the story from really from the beginning and that's kind of what prompted me to uh, start on the book. Well, we're also thankful you took <clears throat> such wonderful records because uh, it truly is a gift uh, to be able to see all the insights of, you know, what all happened with this amazing career Wilson, Wilson had. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things we talked about, uh, not only in remembering Wilson, as you've mentioned, but um, the inspiration about what Wilson had to say um, would you like to touch on that for a few moments? Well, I think he was born to be a painter. And he, um, his early encouragement from his mother um, and his, the fact that she was a watercolor painter, um, just an amateur, and had uh, associations with other painters and they used to go out together and paint uh, with people around Santa Fe, like Joseph Bachos, who was a watercolor painter. So um, that was uh, kind of the, the beginning of Wilson's career as a painter and his uh, relationship to New Mexico was another very important tie to how he became a painter. <clears throat> well, and I can tell you after spending extended periods of time in the land of enchantment, it is an absolutely stunning, 
stunning place to be at all times of the year, really, you know, uh, you know, I know that you all have been there long enough to travel to different portions of the state and, you know, just as I've gotten to know the state better, you know, I'd always been up north in Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Taos, and then, you know, I've had the opportunity to go a little farther south and see the southern, you know, national forests and hatch and, it's really a state that for people who have not really explored the state of New Mexico, uh, I really feel like everyone would really benefit by doing that. And, you know, I think that Wilson's attraction to the state of New Mexico is what helped him see the beautiful skies, um, not only from being a New Mexican, but being a pilot. That's right. Yes. And uh, I think his uh, devotion to painting the skies probably was um, greatly enhanced by his being a pilot. And he always said that uh, it was flying that uh, really made him committed as a pilot, as a uh, painter. <clears throat> well, and I know that a lot of us now have been on airplanes and we've played with drones or seen those experiences, but what an, what an, uh, an advantage for Wilson, as you said, who was born to be a painter, to get that perspective of being up high so that he could really appreciate color values of the sky and really see those prisms and, and those different gradients. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? And you, you can see that in his work. His, uh, you know, it was, it's not only close-up work, it's great distances that really fascinated him. How do you communicate where you are and the, the vast distances like in a Grand Canyon or uh, thousands of miles away in the sky. And he studied atmospheric perspective, um, not only as a pilot, but certainly as a painter. Well, he certainly did. And he was certainly fantastic about it. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things we talked about before and I, I apologize to everyone watching the show. Uh, Roz had the most amazing insight and talk with me um, a couple of weeks ago before we got ready to film today, and just so many amazing things you shared, and I really appreciate that. So we'll try to share that with all the viewers. But um, you know, one of the things you brought up was when Wilson was first starting, there were some struggles and some hurdles, um, and for newer artists or <clears throat> artists who aren't you know, as far along in their development as they want to be. Uh, would you mind sharing some of those struggles and hurdles that we discussed previously that, that he overcame? Well, I don't remember exactly what we discussed, but, <laughs> but um, when he finally decided after uh, his family um, left him and went back east, he uh, was continuing to practice law, and he was um, uh, a, a man who was dying, came in to get his will done. And uh, the man was supposed to have maybe 18 months to live. And here Wilson was uh, in a small law practice and um, not very happy, and his his family was back east and had left him. And he decided, if I had 18 months to live, what would I do? And uh, he, without even thinking further, he decided that he would probably get some really good painting equipment and try to paint at least one good painting. So he went home that night after he dictated that will to his secretary and uh, sat on the side of the bed and said, what's the difference between 18 months, 18 years or the rest of your life? So he went back to his office the next day and he decided, he told his secretary, I'm going to shut this down in a, in a um, 
period of time, I'm going to take my time to shut this practice down. I won't leave my clients in a lurch, but I think that I need to commit myself to something that I've wanted to do and have been doing as a part-time. I'm going to commit myself now to it. And if I continue to like it and love it and am excited about it, I will stay with it. So that's what he did. Well, <clears throat> we're all thankful he did that. And it takes so much courage and bravery <clears throat> for someone to make a change in their life like that. And he was 40 that. Years old. wow, that's, you know, when I was younger, I thought, well, I have 40 years old, I'll, I'll be there one day. And now that I've passed that, I'm like, yeah, I was still a pretty young guy back at 40, you know, I mean, come on now. Let's <laughs> not pick on ourselves just yet. <laughs> Well, with, um, with that courage and bravery, let's transition uh, back to your beginnings here as an author. And what, what you know, I know that you missed Wilson and you wanted to uh, have what he had to say properly documented in his biography, but what were some early struggles and hurdles that you faced of, okay, do I go high school and make a rough draft and have a friend look it over or you know it could it, it could feel I, I would imagine and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth but I can imagine through the journey of writing a book that there'd be some times that you felt like there were some serious roadblocks and you know possibly you could share with others that you know what you did to overcome some of those challenges and roadblocks in creating this this book well you know, as I was painting, and I was uh, being fairly productive as a painter, and um, yet all of the time that uh, I was trying to cope with Wilson's death, I felt that um, I had an obligation to share what I knew about him. And so I started writing the stories that he told me. And then it, it became a bigger, a bigger job because I realized that I knew a lot more about how he worked. And so I started uh, making notes and all of a sudden it just grew and I had pages of, of, uh, of notes and so I thought well you know this is this is really bigger than just a little biography that uh that I might want to share with his children because I I didn't know a lot of those early stories that they didn't know so it it just kind of grew and there really was never any roadblock or any writer's block about it. Uh, it just, it just came. And uh, I was very fortunate after I had the pretty much the text written, um, I encountered a person here in uh, Santa Fe who was uh, an excellent editor, Susan McGarry. And uh, she had been working with Fresco Books, which is a, an outfit here in town that does art books. And it just all came together. Well, and I know uh, when you're talking about it all coming together, <clears throat> when we were talking art, you know, one of the things that you were discussing was what Wilson said about a painting, about get it down. And if your heart's in it, it's going to show. So, um, with those, how did that relate to the writing process? I mean, obviously your heart was in it. And did you take those same teachings from Wilson to the book about let's get it down and we can edit later? Yes, I think that's an appropriate way to, uh, to explain it. Exactly. That you just, you, it's, um, you know, it was not a um, organic thing that grew piece by piece. It, it was, it just, um, there were smatterings here and smatterings there, and, and they would come to me in the middle of the night, and I'd get up and make a little note about it, and 
that's kind of how it grew. It was a, a, not a very organized way of growing, but, uh, but you know, it, it somehow came together. And then with Susan's help too, I, uh, I was able to eliminate things that were not really appropriate and, uh, and put in, uh, magnify things that, that really were more important. Well, what were some of your <clears throat> highlights through the process or your favorite parts uh, about writing this book? What, what, what was the, 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 if you're looking back and saying, you know, this, this is probably what I, what I enjoyed the most. Well, I don't know. I, you know, it was not a labor. I didn't find it to be lab laborious, but um, one thing that I really wanted to include and thought was valuable was the, the second part the part about Wilson's process and what he said to young painters who would send him slides of their work and he would comment on them. And I thought that that was really valuable information that you really don't find very often in art books or in any books. So um, I thought that was a good <clears throat> Correct. And, you know, and I think that's what's so important, you know, from being around the art business, like my wife and I have since 1995, and we are not artists in any way, shape or form. But we've been very thankful for artists like, you know, Wilson Hurley, Dan Gerhards, Grant Redden, Tony Hostetler, all these wonderful, kind people who've really helped us understand artists, understand the art better. Walt and Dan obviously were our mentors and taught us a ton. And I don't know if it's just they saw us as a blank canvas or if artists really truly enjoy giving back and helping each other out. I think they do. I, if, if they have any generosity of a spirit, they certainly do want to share. And they realize that nobody's going to duplicate what they do. They can't. The message is the individual's message. And if, if Wilson could help somebody say it better in a in a more skillful way um that was his that was his joy <clears throat> well and I, I remember we also discussed too about getting the truth down and um your explanation of it's that artist's view of that moment and perhaps you want to revisit that with our guests as well yes he he's made lots of field studies, but a field study has, is still going to be only one moment, one vision that uh, captures you. And um, that, was, that was important. You can't, you can't keep chasing the sun. You have to stick with where the sun was where, when you, you were captured by the scene. Well, and I thought that was a great, uh, a great explanation because <clears throat> I know several artists will use photographs and I know that that was something Wilson didn't do. Um, and I loved your comment about the tricky part is getting the motion and mm -hmm. that um, perhaps you can share with the audience um, what you and I talked about, about Wilson saying that, you know, the photography actually freezes the moment and, you know, he wanted to remember it to help capture that motion. Well, that's true, but I, I will correct you a little bit because he did use photographs. Oh, okay. He used photographs to um, remind, remind him of certain things that, that he, details that he didn't necessarily remember. Um, they were documents that uh, helped him fix his memory. And uh, so he definitely did use photographs. And I think almost everyone does. They, the color is not valid, the color from a photo. And he moved landscape around. He used to say he, he moved real estate around all of the time. Because if a, a rock was in the way of what he was trying to say, he'd take that rock out. Or if he needed one, he'd put a rock in. 
So yeah, it, it's a it's a flexible kind of thing. But no, he he did use photos, and I think anybody who um, you know Clark Hewlings, all of them, Bob Lockheed. I'm not sure whether he did, but uh, he probably did. Bob used to make all kinds of um, um, individual sketches of a horse or a, a trailer or a, a, a person on horseback, and he'd put them into his landscapes. <laughs> and uh, you know, Bob was not a landscape painter; he was a he was a person painter. Yeah. <clears throat> and a fine one at that too as well um you talk about moving real estate around that takes me back to an old newsletter where we took our children uh for their first trip to new mexico and i told them we're going to be driving through paintings and they said well what are those power lines doing on top of those mountains and i said well it's an artist's creativity you know uh freedom that they get to do to move those things around and you know just it was neat to give a young some young kids in art education as far as you know just because it's there doesn't mean the painter is going to stick it in the piece <laughs> you don't have to paint the the blemish on a person's cheek <laughs> exactly exactly well up next we have a slideshow i'm going to queue up and we're going to look at a few images um, of the book and wilson and um <clears throat> talk a little triptych and then we're going to move into Roz's work as well and talk about that so if everyone will be patient with me just for a moment for me to share my screen and get all this ready to go then we will get going here so you share a screen hopefully I'm doing it Roz are you seeing the slideshow no okay well I'm I'm working on it I better fix the screen first then. Back in June when I did a bunch of these, I was going really fast. So I appreciate everyone's. Uh, well, listen, we're impressed with whatever you do. These, <laughs> these are challenges we've all learned to deal with. Did that one come up? I yes. Think so. All right. Now I'll clean it up here a little bit. Again, thank you everyone for your patience. Oop, I went. A little too far forward. Let me go back here. All righty. <clears throat> so again, just to remind everyone, the um, book is The Life and Art of Wilson Hurley, celebrating the richness of reality. And <clears throat> we have Roz on here as well as the author. So um, with so many amazing images, um, one of them had to make the cover. Um, would you like to share with us why this was the one that was chosen to be the cover? Well, this is a view from our house at uh, just after sundown. And, you know, it was not easy to choose a, uh, an image for the book. Um, so there were many that could have been chosen, but this one uh, seemed appropriate. Well, it's a stunning piece. It's I was just curious when I first saw it, I thought, you know, wow, that would be a really, really hard to see decision because he has so many amazing pieces so yeah you can see the river you can see the uh the mountains in the back um and the sky and is phenomenal the foreground is of course right up my um, west view <clears throat> which it i've been fortunate enough to make it out there a few times and it's just stunning every time so how fortunate, uh, you know, for you to be able to have coffee there and breakfast and lunch and dinner and just see the sky change all day. That would, that's just amazing. So, all righty. Well, here's a little bit more of a write up on the on the piece where it does mention Susan and Peter and yourself as you know, working together to create the book. And I don't know if people are seeing us, but I'm just going to kind of move us around to get us out of the way. But um, I'm trying. <laughs> Um, but here's Wilson posing in front of one of the triptychs, and um, <clears throat> I, I know most people know who've really studied Wilson, the process of him building uh, what he built so that he could paint the sections of the pieces, you know, as he did, and then move them out here. Would you like to share just a couple tidbits with the audience <laughs> about 
uh, kind of how that process went and how this is really the first time he really saw them all laid out in, a, in, in their full display was when he was in Oklahoma City. Well, the, the whole project took over five years and uh, we, Wilson committed to it. And uh, then he had to start working on just the logistics of it, getting the canvases from uh, Europe and um, arranging for someone to do the, the frames and uh, we had a conservator who did all of the hanging and he, uh, the, the, the canvases were painted individually, these, these big canvases one at a time um, in the studio here on an easel that had to, uh, that what, it was rolling because they, they're 16 feet high and the, 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 they wouldn't, um, the studio wouldn't accommodate that kind of a, a uh, size. And so he could only paint it, um, he could only see each canvas about eight feet uh, about eight feet worth of canvas at a time. So it was quite a long process. And as I say, it took five years. And over that period of time, uh, it involved not only acquiring the materials, but acquiring the people to help, acquiring the um, framer to, to do the complicated and appropriate frames, as well as, um, shipping them, they were shipped rolled um, on a big two and a half foot diameter um, drum. So it was a complicated um, project that engulfed his whole life for that period of time and pretty much mine too. I was painting, but uh, yeah, I, was, I was a helper as well. Well, and one last thing to touch on before we move on, um, per our last conversation, what I'm fascinated about, and you said he did use, you know, thin amounts of paint so it wouldn't, you know, crack, but just the amount of paint that would have gone into covering, you know, the, the size of these pieces. I mean, that's a, that's a ton of paint. Yeah, well, it, it was, and um, we had to acquire it all at, at first, we, we didn't want to end up not having enough for each, each one of the triptychs. So it had, to be, it had to be acquired in volume. And he did all kinds of uh, tests for um, the, uh, the consistencies of the paints because some, although Windsor Newton and some of the big companies uh, are all uh, designed to, to give you an absolutely con consistent cadmium red from one year to the next. Not all the com companies can do that. And so we had to do some investigating to determine that that was the, the case with the paints that he used. <clears throat> well, and like we talked about too, you know, if you look over his shoulder here to the viewer's left, I mean, just keeping that consistency of pick a color, the green, the yellow, as it, and the purples, as it goes from one, you know, the triptych pieces to the next. It's just yeah. fascinating that the, you know, yes, they're beautiful when you stand back and look and be like, wow, this really freezes you. It's so pretty. But then it, the more you know about painting a piece of art, you go, how did he keep that color so consistent? <laughs> That's just fascinating. It, it's a challenge. And uh, the final, uh, well, there are five tri triptychs in the, and the process improved as he continued to work. The first one, uh, he thought that he could probably match pretty well by just doing paint swatches on a, on a canvas, on a, on a separate canvas, and uh, then match to that when he got to the second and third piece of the triptych. But then he had to, and that was this first one that we're looking at here. Then he had 
to be sure that they were uh, that they matched pretty well. And um, he found that he had to go back into this one and, uh, and do a little touch up on some of them to be sure that, uh, that they, the transition was appropriate. Well, what a, what a fun process to have a backstage pass to that. that it might, I know it was a long process, but you know, to, to be a part of a historical moment like that, that must have just been fascinating. Yes, Walter and Dan were involved in all of that too. They used to come out and, <clears throat> and uh, see what was going on. Well, I, I, I don't blame him. Heck, if I knew that was going on, I'd been coming by to, to snoop. And I, I don't think there was a better term. I would have been snooping just so I would kind of know what to expect just because of being a little giddy. But uh, with this one, uh, it's probably, you know, not, I know I'm not supposed to say which one's my favorite, but it is probably one of my favorites, not just because of the painting, but because of the story in the painting. Um, so if everyone will pardon the graffiti for a moment, the red arrow is supposed to lead the eye so that next time you all are visiting the amazing uh, hall, as we call it, but the Cowboy Western Heritage Museum, uh, there's a little story about something hidden up there on the on the top of the waterfall, do you, would you like yeah. to? Well, the arrow doesn't point to the right place. Oh, am I off a little bit? So I think I need to be over here. That's right. Okay. That's so right. Here's, here's our editing for the moment, but it's actually right here. That's right. Off. But um, there, there's there's something hidden in the painting there that you I thought I'll, I'll be quiet and let you share with everyone. I, I belong to the, the secret. Uh, this was the very last of the whole triptych process project. And uh, he was um, very happy that it was coming to an end. And he decided that he would put two figures up. There is a uh, right where on the other side of the, of where the, that right there, that's where there is a um, overlook. And so he put Wilson Hurley in that overlook and Roz Hurley in that overlook. And of course, Wilson is probably about not even seven eighths of an inch high. And I was probably five eighths of an inch high. And so when he uh, proudly told me that, that he had painted our portraits in there, I went up close to it, you know, as I say, we were only just very small. And I said to him, my hips are too big. <laughs> it's one of Dan Blanchard's favorite stories. So thank you for sharing because it's, it's just make, that's why this piece is. Yeah, we, were both, we were both joking about it because it was such a relief to have the whole project. Uh, coming to an end. <clears throat> well, and one other fun inside tip uh, to share, you know, Dan used to love to tell this story too, that um, as a married spouse of an artist and being Wilson's wife, there were times that you used to try to walk all the way across the room to compose yourself. Um, you'd sneak a glance out of your eye before you turned around to tell him what you thought. Um, was this one of those moments too, or did you just go right up to it? Well, no, this was not one of those moments. This was this was a happy moment. We were we were very very happy that this whole big project was finally coming to an end, and this was the very last piece that he was painting. You know, he the other triptychs he painted the center pieces first, but on this one, he decided to leave the centerpiece to the last so that the, the, they were hung at the hull and um, the, the two, if you can imagine what a strange picture it would be with these two paintings, side paintings there and not have the centerpiece. Hmm. And uh, he thought it would be a great, kind of a dramatic moment to, to un unveil that big one finally. 
Oh, that, that is fun. Well, thank you so much. It's always nice to get little tidbits about <clears throat> something that everyone has common knowledge about as far as the, the triptychs and then and then know which one came first and which one came last. And uh, so thank you so much for sharing that with everyone. Well, I could, I could go on forever about the triptychs because they were they seemed to take up forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, and maybe we'll do another show about that down the line and we can share some more information about uh, certain aspects of it that we feel like could help artists and that way Wilson can continue to help artists who uh, maybe are looking at doing a triptych so um, now on they, pardon me I hope they do do well, triptychs I do too well here's a piece by you um, that you paint under your maiden name Rosalind Remke um, and this is August Sunset from the Sandia um, would you like to share with the viewers a little bit about specifically where you were with this piece and the color values you, you captured in this landscape? This is uh, from my west view. It, we're looking west toward the sunset. And Wilson, of course, painted it any number of times. And uh, this one it was a particularly dramatic sunset and I had been working on uh, um, landscape with a friend of mine and um, so this it seemed appropriate to to try to do the shading of the sky the way he advocated you can see the the uh, shades from uh, the brilliant sunset to the green that it passes through up to deep blue. And uh, I think though that there is a, 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 a problem with that slide because uh, that one little bright spot in the sky is not really real. <laughs> that That is a product of the slide or of the uh, image it's so if you can forget that that's in there yeah you, you'll see that could be a error on the part of the photographer this a guy who's not very good at taking <laughs> photos so one it's of amazing. my favorite parts of this piece is that moment and it's so exciting it's almost like when a firecracker is just starting to go off at a big display because i'll use my cursor here but you have these dark values in these clouds that as the sun's going to go down these will illuminate as the cloud is up here and the edges are starting to do here and it's such an exciting time when you're watching a sunset that um you know a lot of people go up oh, it's almost over let's go back to the car and it's like no 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 just wait you know it, it changes well and and it's a real challenge to paint it the uh, the uh, values in the the foreground are especially a challenge because uh, you've got really dark and then there's a transition of values clear to the sunset, the, the very, very bright sun. And uh, it's, it's a, a, a real challenge. And, you know, I normally didn't do things like that because uh, I had uh, a pretty accomplished sunset painter here in, in the house. Yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, this was done after Wilson was gone. I didn't have the nerve to do it while he was still alive. <clears throat> well, we're glad you did because I think it's an exceptionally beautiful piece. So you should be very proud of yourself. I'm, I very much enjoy it. And I know the challenges you faced and you did an amazing job. Another thing that you do so well that I'm so fascinated about, and again, the slide's probably not as good as it should be, an older camera phone shot. Um, but just your ability to capture glass, I just, I think you're so good at it. And, um, you know, you've explained it to me before and you may share something uh, when I'm done talking about why it works, but it just, it fascinates me that you can take that, that texture of paint and turn it into glass so well. Well, the, the real um, element to it is values and uh, it's, if, if you can understand the lights and darks and the uh, 
the reflections, the, the values, the, uh, uh, the very careful um, placement of lights and darks, then it's, it's a cinch. All you have to do is, is draw it and, uh, and then study it. And some, some painters who paint glass say that they have to close one eye in order to get the reflections uh, accurate enough, but I don't do that. I just, uh, I just wing it. I just do it. Uh, and, you know, it, it's probably not perfect, but it's an essence of the essence of it, I think. As with, the la as with the landscape, you have such a, you know, short period of time to, you know, capture that moment. Um, with still life like this, how, do you paint during a certain time of the day? Do you go back to it? Because I know with a slide coming up, we've talked about that from time to time. But um, what are what are some tips and strategies you use about keeping the light consistent when you compose a piece like this and study it to make a finished painting? Well, you you uh, if you're lucky, you have a, a, a studio that it has consistent light from the north. And uh, so the light doesn't really change. Um, if you're painting outdoors, of course, it changes and you have to plan for that. But uh, in a studio, your light is consistent. And uh, so you can work on it for, for a long time. The challenge is uh, planning it so that um, the, enough of the paint is wet that you don't have hard edges that you have to then uh, deal with. Um, I now paint, th this was done with brushes, but most of my work now is with, um, with knives. And, um, and that's a whole different um, series of challenges. <clears throat> well, one of my favorite pieces in our house is um, when I needed to be corrected on a newsletter and I, talked about palette knives versus a painting knife and uh, you so generously sent us a gift to remind me what the difference was and it's still hanging on our walls today so <laughs> I now have that up and it's one of my favorite pieces um, again going with glass this is a, another piece that I like so what so much just because of all the challenges uh, that would present itself you know with the reflection on the table from the silver the glass the reflection in the silver with other items from the <clears throat> still life here. Um, and I'll let you talk about this piece a little more, but I just, I just love how this piece came together. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, this is a, a piece that um, was from the, the um, wooden piece is from Wilson's mother. And it, it's a carved piece. You can see there's a, kind of a wolf's head right there and other things. Um, and then this um, is in the dining room and I left it in there because it's a heavy piece. So I, I set up in there and, um, and painted it. Um, fortunately, the, the light was fairly consistent, but the challenge is to um, give yourself the, uh, to give the sense that there's the, the um, surface is flat and um, you can see how, what a challenge the reflections are because you don't normally see um, a wooden top that's just one kind of milky color. It's you usually when you're thinking of it, it's it's wood and it's it's brown, but you can't paint it that way. You have to paint what you're looking at. You, you can't paint what you know is there. You have to paint what you see is there. The same with the peaches and the um, the reflections that they give. <clears throat> well, and I love how you brought that into the silver, and then there's the you know the edge of the. The wooden piece and the sheen uh, with the reflection up top. I mean, it's just a stunning, stunning piece that must have been so fun to, to create. 
Um, this is a piece that I've always loved just because, you know, back when I used to be able to eat meat, I was a big lobster fan and loves a nice buttery white wine to go with it and some crispy bread. But um, tell us a little bit more about this piece because another concept with glass that I'm fascinated about is, you know, wine bottles and you do those so well. Well, um, and you know, we had, we developed a very nice collection of wine. And so it was an important part of our lives. Uh, Dan Blanchard was a, a big part of that too. And this one actually was done with knives so that you can see in the bread a little bit more um, texture than you would if it were really smooth. And the same with the lobster and the, and the glass. So um, this was a fun piece to do. And I had a, a um, fish market, a, a lady you, who used to have uh, these lobsters. And so I bought one specifically to paint and um, and fortunately I could put it in the refrigerator and it kept long enough to, to get it down. It was fun. Well it's it's stunning to look at and uh, looks delicious too so that looks like it would have been a lot of fun. Now this piece is unavailable it is sold but uh, again, one of the reasons I brought this up was the study of light from the candle, the paper, the different colors of cut, I mean, uh, textures of cut glass in here. And so I uh, just wanted to bring this up to discuss it for all the collectors and viewers to, to appreciate. So the, the fun part about that was uh, that um, is a, a, I think it's a Madeira, I'm not sure, but I loved the bottle and the bottle was all dusty and it had this wrapper around it. And when I set it up there, I thought, gee, I wonder how, what a challenge it would be to paint that paper. And so that was kind of the impetus for, for putting that all together. Well, it's certainly stunning. Um, and is there, with the smooth glasses, as we saw on a couple slides ago, versus these cut glass uh, crystal pieces, is there a different approach or is it just a very similar, just, you know, a little bit different detail? Well, it's, it's a challenge to paint uh, cut glass. Um, I'm particularly proud of the stopper that is down there below. You can see that uh, that one, the reflection of, the stopper and the uh, and the just the stopper itself. Um, it was it was lots of fun. Well, but I, you know, just the same. You just have to kind of study, and you you can't um, just leap into it. You have to study where where the light is and where the uh, uh, reflections are and uh, the difference look at the dark part of that um, decanter. See, that is a result of the reflection of the, the uh, dark table. But it's, you know, it's you can't take all the straight way across. You have to look at it and see where the reflection and where the dark part is. Well, and the challenge of picking up the candlelight and the cut glass too you know, adds a whole nother challenge and, and, uh, and dimension to the piece. So it's just, just a really, really yeah. nice, nice piece. That's very well done. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, this is a landscape comparison. Uh, these pieces are both unavailable. They've been sold. But one of the things Roz and I wanted to discuss and share with everyone today is here's a very similar scene. Uh, one of them, obviously, in the snow, and one of them with a you know, the hue of that sun in the background and how that, that time of day can greatly change a piece so much. Well, they're both in the snow, Clay. Uh, oh, I... it's, the same. <laughs> it's the same tree. And I painted it another time also uh, before the 
it was early morning and um, so there, there were three, a succession of three that I did uh, of the same scene, uh, simply because it was interesting and, and it changed and uh, I wanted to kind of work it. They're very small painting, um, I think eight by eight inches and done again with the palette knife. Well, and I always think it's so fun uh, when you get a, some pieces like this where there's been a snowstorm that's come through and, you know, it looks so cold and, you know, like, oh, don't go out there when it's gray and it just feels colder, but it's probably the same temperature, but just that value of the sunlight, you know, in a, in a sunset uh, really brings out the different colors. Um, another comparative thing is, you know, being in Oklahoma, we see this kind of snow on the right where I'm moving the cursor, which is white. You know, a lot of times this blue value in the snow until people get where that snow's had an opportunity to refreeze, that blue color is something that a lot of people in this part of the country don't get to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're looking south uh, from, from uh, my, my um, um, house, um, the west side of the house so you're you're looking south and the uh, the sun is has set probably um the sun is farther to the right but um i thought the the uh the sky was very interesting the way uh it changes changed color and very much <clears throat> very much was that evening and kind of going back to the other uh, sunset piece you know the fact that you did this one at an angle you know lets you have the foreground values a lot more pronounced uh, as opposed to the darker values when you're looking straight into a sunset exactly well <clears throat> um this is our ending so to speak of the the, the chat, as we can see, we put a little collage together here of some portrait work of Wilson and you all uh, posing for a photo there. And um, again, the information, if everyone would like a, a copy of The Life and Art of Wilson Hurley, written by Roz Rimke Hurley, uh, edited by Susan Halston McGarry and uh, with the forward by Peter Hasrick. Um, any final thoughts on the, on the book and the process you'd like to share with anyone? No, I, um, I'm glad it's available, and I think it's probably, um, um, it was to be a record of Wilson's work, and um, I thought that uh, it was appropriate for me to do it. I think other people will probably write about him, and uh, from a different point of view, from maybe a, a, a more academic point of view, but um, this was what I thought was valuable to talk about for his, for his memory. Well, we all thank you so much for all your hard work, not only with your painting, but your work as an author as well. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we just, we really appreciate the time you've spent with us today to talk about the book, talk about his work, your work, and it's, uh, it's been a big pleasure. So, I'll hit the stop share button here real quick. And here we are back in, in larger view. Um, before we go, Roz, um, what's up next? You know, you've, you've done your triptychs with this book with Wilson and um, you're back at the easel, which I'm excited to hear. So uh, what's next for Roz? Well, I think I will continue to paint and try to get back to, to the painting that I, uh, it, to the level of painting that I was doing before the before the book, but I think these these programs that you're putting together, Clay, are just really lovely and um, valuable for the for the art group that you communicate with, and uh, and I know that involves collectors as well as our other artists and. Um, just tell them to keep on painting and sculpting. Well, I certainly will. And thank you so much for your kind words. We're, um, 
we're, we're just getting started on this and I'm sure it's very basic at best right now. And we'll try to get better and more tech savvy and uh, maybe even get interactive one day, who knows? But uh, the biggest purpose of this really is to let the artists talk about the art in the beginning and um, give their work a voice, so to speak, as we've all talked. And it's, it's just, I feel that these shows, the real value in it is letting the artists talk about their work because there's certain things that maybe a collector doesn't see um, in the piece and with the artist talking about it, they can appreciate their work even more. Or as we've talked about earlier today, a, a newer painter, a younger painter, or someone who's looking to refine something in their work um, to help them learn and get better too as well. So, you know, Walton Dan Roy is about art education and that's something Julie and I still value very much. And uh, we're hoping that continues. Well, they certainly were about education and that's how we first got to know them. And uh, I think it's wonderful that you're continuing that tradition. Thank you very much. Well, we thank everyone for joining us today with our show. Uh, these pieces that we discussed are obviously available for you to purchase of Roz's. Uh, you can feel free to contact me through our website, greatvinegalleryokc.com. You may call us at 405-528-3739, or you may email us at clay.grapevine at gmail.com. All of that will be on the website, but uh, this show will obviously air for our big winter festival, and you can call, call me up and we'll just uh, make arrangements to get one of these beautiful pieces in your collection. So Roz, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Clay. Good luck to you. And good luck to you.